Hello and welcome to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Thank you for joining me here today. So today we're going to be talking with my friend Krista Beegler. So let's learn a little bit about her. So Krista Beegler is an award-winning dietitian nutritionist, host of the Less Stressed Life podcast, which I was on recently, so go check out that episode, and author of the Eczema Relief Diet and Cookbook. She helps health-savvy women beat bloat, burnout and eczema breakouts with her podcast programs and private practice. She lives with her unicycling husband and kids in the Midwest. Krista, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Yeah. And let's not let Dr. Hirsch uh, be too humble. He has two, two episodes on my podcast. One is about fatigue, which I know you hear from him all the time. And the other one is about post COVID syndrome. And I don't know if it, we split it into two parts, but it was really good. And later after this talk, we'll have to talk about some other, another study I just picked up today about, mm. um, COVID stuff. So, which is great because we're always still learning about things and we like to know how that affects different systems. So it's just an awareness thing. So Absolutely. thanks for having me on. You're, you're so sweet. So we're going to be talking today about eczema, right? And I love this title, not black and white, but red all over nutritional implications of eczema. And, you know, interestingly in my practice, I recently had some challenges with eczema. I actually sent you somebody, right? Who you talked to and you guys kind of helped to, to figure things out a little bit, but eczema is a big problem, right? So, and let's talk, what, what is eczema so that we can all get on the same page? Yeah, eczema is part of the atopic march. So often we think it's a, it's a type of skin rash, the most common skin manifestations in general, right? Things that show up on the skin, there's eczema psoriasis. These are a little bit different. Psoriasis is a little bit more, it responds a little bit differently. So we can talk about that later a little bit. So there's eczema, psoriasis, acne, and then like hives or un like random hives, urticaria, et cetera. So eczema is essentially just an inflammatory reaction. We don't even have a, an amazing definition for it, but it affects a ton of people. It affects 10 to 20% of kids and one to 3% of adults. And what it often does is it presents as a kid and then you kind of grow out of it, quote unquote, but not really. It grows into this. This is why it's part of the atopic March or the allergic March. It becomes asthma or um, allergy essentially, or these things really coexist kind of an inflammatory skin reaction on the outside, but that's like a, a sad, um, a sad, not good enough um, statement really. Gotcha. You were cutting out a little bit there. So we may want to um, stop turn, the videos. Yeah, stop the video. Unfortunately, all right. that's um, all right. But I think we got most of it. So it's the it's that allergic march, and that as you get older, it changes its spots. So it goes from you know that ten to twenty percent as a kid, but then oftentimes then it's manifesting as asthma and some of these other conditions. Was that the gist right. of it? Yep, totally. Okay, great. And so then let's get down kind of into, you talked a little bit about eczema versus psoriasis, some of these different skin issues. How do you different, differentiate those? What is, what is the difference down kind of at the cellular le level or wherever you want to go with that? Well, usually you get a diagnosis at the doctor's office and what you're supposed to get for, um, for psoriasis is really a biopsy. And to be honest, I'm not sure what they see in the biopsy compared to eczema, but this is what we universally accept as eczema. Now, whether it shows up like this, and actually I want to talk about what, what we universally accept and then how it might be different if you go into your clinician office. So we know that eczema on the skin is kind of staphylococcus aureus overgrowth. And so it's important. So one of the problems with eczema is when we scratch, we translocate bacteria. So we translocate it from the arm, you know, where it shows up so commonly as the inside of the crooks of the elbow and behind the knees. And those are kind of like very consistent places. You see it as a kiddo where it's bright and red. And we could maybe talk about commonly what we see that being related to, but when you scratch, you're going to move bacteria under your nail to a different place. And I do want to mention the importance, like that's an important conversation. And I want to mention that, okay, if we have topical staph overgrowth, the skin grows from the inside out, right? So I think that that's important to mention. 
Mm-hmm. But also if you try to go get, there are fungal kinds of looks to skin, or um, if you go to get this cultured, topically, it doesn't always come out quite like that. So I think the staff culture is a little more, I mean, I'm not the derm, but I've talked to a lot of derms about this because I've run into it in practice. So the staff culture, to my understanding, comes out a little more accurately. The fungal culture is not super accurate. And I've had like some very significant situations where we're pretty sure it's fungal. It responds to antifungals. It responds. So that's a big one. If it responds to antifungals, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you culture it and it's not a fungus and it responds to antifungals, then I'm probably going to go with how it responds, right? Because we really care about how things improve overall. Mm-hmm. So I think that's maybe good for someone to know because otherwise we get disappointed when like a lab test is negative. And I think that lab tests are only haha <laughs> skin deep just kidding uh they're only like they're they're only relevant to a certain extent and how your symptoms are are more relevant overall so fungus can be a big thing what i wanted to say here is that from the shoulders up there's an increase in a fungal like family called malassezia and so that's why so often with even if we can be talking about dandruff right now often we think about dandruff being pretty fungal or cradle cap as a kid Right. And so all these people will use coconut oil on cradle cap as a baby, which is okay. But coconut oil has a, you know, it has some caprylic acid in it. Caprylic acid is a very concentrated, concentrated, I suppose, compound or extract from coconut oil. And that's a very specific antifungal. Mm -hmm. However, if you just like constantly use, I'm off on some tangents, you constantly use coconut oil in the skin. Uh, I have a microbiologist friend who says that really disrupts the skin microbiome too. And so we could talk about topicals. Like, I think the bottom line I want to say about eczema in general is that we always want, we want to go after something like it's an external problem when it looks external, but it's not always external, it's external, internal. And that's why it's almost easier to address Crohn's or colitis because we know where it's at. (laughs) It's internal. And then when it's a skin issue, it's internal and external. So I think we can get frustrated with that sometimes. Some skin issues respond very quickly and some respond slowly. Do you want to know what those look like? I do. All right, great. Um, cause this will kind of tell me, and this is basically just clinical. When I am going to talk to some about their skin, I ask them for a picture because you can tell a lot from a picture very quickly. Mm -hmm. So earlier we were talking about how bright red eczema in the elbows and behind the knees, um, is very consistent with kiddos. Well, what will happen? Let's just talk about what a very common progression is. And we talked about a little, I alluded to it just a touch earlier, but what I'll see all the time is kids. You have that particular presentation of eczema as a kid, and then you quote unquote grow red. So let's talk about bright red eczema. That is like when you're almost certain that there's a staff situation, you're almost certain that there's a staff situation and I would say that nine times out of 10, there's a huge gut mediated component. So if you just start in the gut and you work on overgrowth of staph, strep and whatever else. And by the way, I was talking to a skin friend, a skin practitioner friend of mine today. We were talking about research around, (laughs) I'll just bring this right away. Well, we were talking about literal research around parasites and because I don't want to be the person to talk. I, I always say like, I work with a lot of health practitioners. And so I don't want to be the one to bring up parasites because it sounds crazy, right? It sounds crazy, but they're around. And so we've got literature where it's like, um, I don't know if it's blastocystis hominis, where there's a big incidence of blasto. And I I, I might be miss, miss um, saying which one. There's big incidence with like hives or chronic hives. And a lot of people will go in and they'll just have hives randomly. Like, oh, you just have hives. Like, no, no one just has hives. Why do you just have hives? Right. And so anyway, anytime something is bright and red, and here's another one, if it is kind of, we actually, there's like nine different types of eczema and I probably couldn't say them all. Um, but numular is where it's kind of a round nickel shaped one. And that one is almost always in like, there is some kind of gut fungus, bacteria, et cetera, manifestation, almost always. Like that's just what it looks like on the outside, like every single time. Um, now I will say psoriasis tries to look like that. And psoriasis doesn't respond exactly the same way. Psoriasis is kind of like not my best friend because it doesn't respond exactly the same way as eczema. So this is why it's nice to get the diagnosis differential because sometimes you'll have both handy, right? You can have both the autoimmune manifestation of psoriasis, which is going to respond to, you know, for example, 
there are, you know, you can respond, your skin can respond to dietary changes, but with psoriasis, it's, it might respond to certain things. And with eczema it might respond. And I, I careful when I say this, because I often, I also see, you probably see this too. I see people who over restrict and we're trying to come out of that in this upcoming decade. I think mm -hmm. that was an old functional thing where, you know, you gave, you did elimination things and you cut down diets and this becomes a really toxic, bad thing. So we're looking for like expansion of diet long-term. We want to, I always say, we want to use our food. <laughs> we want to be able to digest and use it. So what happens, I'm off on this tangent, but it's all related, Dr. Hirsch. If you great. don't, if you don't use your food, so this is why it's like so tricky. I'm glad we're having this opportunity to talk about why this happens in skin. If you don't digest food properly, which is going to happen anytime there's gut imbalances because they throw a wrench in the enzymatic process. If you don't digest properly, that undigested stuff feeds the bad stuff and it proliferates on the skin because the skin is a safe place for your body to get rid of crap. And so it's one of those mechanisms of elimination. You can sweat, you can urinate, you can have a bowel movement or, you know, and so sweating and skin. Yes. So, or you can breathe. These are all mechanisms of elimination and the skin is just a safe one if you can't. And so, you know, this, the first question is I always love a skin case where someone's a little bit constipated. It's like, cool. Can't get rid of things that way. You must be getting rid of things through your skin a little right. bit. So if it's bright and red, I always think gut manifestations first. So that's where I actually start. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if you've had that as a kid? So you already started with stuff as a kid. And by the way, in the opportunities, I, if I'm seeing a little kid, which is, you know, a fairly common event, I am working with their parent typically, right? Especially five and under. And I will say that the times I've gotten to see testing side by side of moms and babies, or you get to go through that whole history of mom and of mom and child. There's absolutely a relationship mm -hmm. from mom's microbiome to baby microbiome. And there is a little bit of literature around that for sure. It's never anyone's fault, but we share microbiome in the family, as you know, right? Absolutely. All right. So that's, that's gut manifestation. That was a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, lots and lots of good stuff. So you talked about in these infections being on the skin. And you talked about the infections being in the gut. And so just for people who are listening, Staph aureus is a bacteria. The fungus could be yeast, could be candida, other types of yeast like you talked about, but could be on the skin, could be in the gut. Now we know that autoimmunity is the immune system reacting to the skin, right? So it's causing some sort of breakdown or inflammation at the skin, right? From the immune system. Is the immune system reacting to the bug in the gut? and then projecting it out onto the skin? Or is it actually reacting to the bug on the skin? What do you think? I think both happen. I don't think you can look at that as a silo. So again, if the skin grows from the inside out, so what commonly happen? what you wanna see is like, you wanna see the, the exacerbation of skin issue come down on the top, on the, on the outside, it just go away topically. And there are some, there are some good, um, there are some good interventions topically. We, I'm happy to talk about them. But the unfortunate part is sometimes it'll just pop back if things are out of whack on the inside. Now, here's a other fun relapse pearl that you can clear up some gut stuff, but after you get like a cold or you're having staph and strep overgrowth, you can have kind of low lying levels of that. And if you're, if you have the genetic predisposition to have things pop up on your skin, you lucky duck, you, you and me both, if you have the genetic predisposition to have things pop up on your skin, because you can tell by, if you look at your family history, did anyone in your family history have like skin stuff at all? Or do they have allergies or asthma whatsoever? Cause you, you then know, like there, there are some genetic components. I, I do not like to blame things on genetics. <laughs> I just like to use them as a teaching tool right. and give the predisposition where things show up on your skin. It may pop up again. So again, a cold, you might have a little staff strep overgrowth on the inside. It looks really bad. This is my really dumb analogy for this. It's like you're in a gymnasium and there's like a bunch of red ping pong balls and white ones. And the white ones are the good stuff. And the red ones are the bad stuff. And when you've got this sinus infection, you've got a real overgrowth of the bad red ones, right? Well, you get those suppressed to where you're not really super symptomatic anymore. You don't really have a cold, but it's going to hang. Like there's no lawn with a perfect with the no weeds. I mean, I'm looking at a lot of dandelions right now and there is no, <laughs> that's just me. I'm in the country. So like, there's no lawn with no weeds unless, you know, you've created that <laughs> you've kind of created that situation naturally probably would not happen on its own. And the same thing happens in our own gut, but is it strong enough to overpower the bad stuff? So what I would say is think about, this is a very common potential situation where someone it's like a month post 
an infection or a cold and you'll have a resurgence of skin stuff. That was actually like a, a big, that was like a big epiphany for me when I started mm-hmm. realizing that for people, because we just need to like, I need people to know that so they can go back and correct, not in a crazy way necessarily. If you can, you know, you always want to listen to your body's whispers before it screams. So if you can start to catch like little bits of things, I'll tell you, I can tell you a little bit of my story and it'll help me, it'll help me set you up for the next kind of eczema if you wanted. Yeah. Um, I'll, well, I'll go there. So if I am on vacation and I am drinking a lot of coffee, which I feel like coffee, no one wants to ever say anything bad about coffee, but it is a dirty little bugger. It is not the cleanest um, crop. It is like not mm. like I could be a, uh, I could be a coffee. Uh, I could be a tester for mold. Would you like to know some, some interesting things about coffee? Coffee is um, sold by weight. I had this coffee guy on one time and he was telling me about visiting a coffee plantation or coffee place where you, you dry out the beans under the, under the tree. And then after they were dried out, there was a guy like watering them down. <laughs> and, and so this guy, this coffee guy I was interviewing said, why are you watering those down? And he says, oh, well, we get paid by weight. So we just, you know, wet them down before we ship them in the barrels. Oh, wow. So coffee is a notoriously moldy crop. Oh, yeah. And so, um, I've seen this in myself and in clients, so mold is a big old fungus. And, uh, I definitely have like family history of fungus stuff <laughs> talking about sharing microbiota, but, uh, if, if you're just like, if you're brewing coffee and kind of brewing yourself like a small fungal load, <laughs> um, so crappy quality coffee, like cheap coffee can, has made me in my past and my clients like jittery and anxious. And you've probably seen this in your clients too, where like crappy coffee will do that. And like a good mm-hmm. quality coffee will not do that. And so if I'm on vacation and I'm overindulging in my coffee, I had a pretty severe eczema flare several years ago, like at the very maybe at the very beginning of my private practice. And which by the way, at the very beginning of your practice, when you're kind of coming out of what you're you're doing, there's more stress. So it exacerbates the whole situation, but it showed up around my eye really. It was so handy. It was around my eye. It's very like inconspicuous places <laughs> around my eye and on my neck. And you know, no one ever asked about it. It was great. That's why, that's why eczema sucks so much because it's an emotional thing. It's like the skin. It's almost like weight loss. Dr. Hirsch. It's almost like weight loss people. It's a vanity thing. And I know it's not really a vanity thing, but it kind of is people will have an internal GI distress and they won't do anything about it. And then they'll finally do something like we'll do. This is human nature. I am no different. We will do something when we feel like our, our vanity is, is compromised, right? That's when we actually take, take the action. So it's around my eye. And if you look at Chinese medicine stuff, they will say that it's liver around the eye. I've never seen that disproven in a client that you shouldn't support liver. So if we think about mechanisms, such an incredible uh, powerhouse, it's such an incredible machine and it has all these processes and it's not the only, it's not the only guy, you know, eliminating stuff, but it's a big, um, it's a big guy trying to break waste down. I would say it's like break boxes down, load them up on a truck and move them on out. But mm-hmm. long story short, things showing up around the eye is liver. So remember I was telling you the story about, Hey, when you're little, often you see bright red eczema and then it might go away. And then as you're an adult, you get this dry skin or dry flakiness, um, manifestation to the eczema. Mm-hmm. Almost always. I find that that is a liver. Now you're not going to find that in a textbook, but I find that that's where you should start. So bright red, you can start with gut stuff, good to go. But if you've got this dry presentation and there's enough history there, you should probably support with the liver. And I think that really just boils down to life that maybe you started with a little bit of imbalance as a kiddo, and maybe that has ebbed and flowed or whatever, or you just have the predisposition to have things show up on the skin. So if if all the things turn out just right, maybe like your microbiome matured at age three, five, it does do that. Um, so it may be at matured and you kind of like, were able to compensate or, or deal with those things. Your body was able to take care of it on its own to, so to speak. And mm-hmm. then you get older and stresses pile up and toxin stress is always going to be just a reality. And I'm not like some kind of weirdo about it. It's just, re- I mean, we're just all exposed to toxins and I have an especially sad, like genetic situation for my liver. And so I should give it some love sometimes if I want to have great skin, that is the story. Like that is where learning my genetics made me feel better. Not that I think people should start there. I think it's a bit overwhelming, but if it looks like that, if it, you know, if it acts like that, looks like that, there's almost always, guess what? You know, it, of course it coexists with other liver signs and symptoms like 
sensitivity to chemicals and smells um, and things like that. Right. And I was absolutely there. Absolutely. That person as well. Like, Oh my gosh, be careful with like this perfume you put on. I still don't like love it. Um, but it's much better than it was. So I would say that's my second kind. It's like, you either start with the gut, if it looks like one thing, or you can start with the liver, if it looks like another way. And there is another way, but, um, what, what interjections do you have from that? Cause I'm a big yapper, as you can tell. You're doing if you great. Give me the chance. <laughs> so then in terms of, I'm a big causes guy. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about infections being a cause and a little bit about the pathophysiology. And I'd love for you to kind of clarify some of that about like what, what's actually happening, but what are some of the other causes that are potentially triggering the immune system to cause this skin eruption? Mm. I mean, I'm like an oversimplification person because you, I could make a big old list and say it's allergy. I mean, we can. So very commonly allergies are a big thing. Um, personal care products can be a thing. I would say a very, um, and, and this is not everyone's situation, but there are, there is a small percentage of skin cases where sodium lauryl sulfate or SLS is like a big driving factor, right? Mm -hmm. But I, that boils down to me to like, Hey, can you clear garbage? You know? So like in what great state is your liver? I mean, I'm always going to oversimplify. I'll keep going through this complicated list, hopefully, <laughs> you know, so there's bacteria and fungal imbalances and protozoa and poor digestion issues. I mean, I feel like those are all together. People would say mm -hmm. food issues, which I feel like there's two types of food issues, a food reaction and a food digestion issue mm -hmm. and a food digestion issue sometimes becomes a food reaction. Uh, we could, we could break that down. Um, so topical stuff, let me, I'll tell you a fun pearl also, or like a fun, I love, I love like stories and case studies because I think they're so impactful for people. I was doing, and, and I don't do this very commonly, but I was working with a client who was half eczema, half psoriasis and psoriasis can be such a, a pain. And so, and they were remodeling an old house and whatnot. And we just decided to do kind of a, essentially an environmental tox panel. And so anyway, I was talking to the, the friend of uh, the consultant who was actually a friend of mine at the company or at the lab, more of a colleague. And we were just talking about what's no, like what they usually see, because that's what I want to know. I'm like, what do you usually see crossing your desk? Like what kind of levels? And she said the worst toxin test she'd ever seen was a teenage girl who was an Instagram influencer and received a lot of personal care products, beauty products for free. She had the worst test result that she'd ever seen. I just thought that was so cool. Right. I'm like, someone should tell that story more often. So here I am telling someone else's story. Cause I think it's kind of interesting, right? Like we don't, we don't think about, you know, everything that touches your skin throughout the day is kind of important. And this is where people say, I've tried everything. I've changed my laundry detergent. I've done this. And it's like, actually you just did this like section of stuff, <laughs> but there's still a whole lot of other things that you could, you could potentially do. So that probably did not fully answer your question, but I'll let you decide where you, <laughs> what you want me to elaborate. No, that's great. And I think that, you know, you mentioned this before, how it's this buildup over time of a lot of this stuff. So it might've been, you know, like when you were a kid or a teenager and you're wearing all these skin products or having exposures to whatever it is, pesticides, herbicides, plastics, whatever you want to call it, heavy metals, chemicals, molds. And then over time, all of a sudden it takes less and less toxicity that you're putting into your body to cause more of a reaction. Would you say that's accurate? I would say that's accurate. Um, and you cut out for a second, but I, it sounded good from everything I heard. Okay. Okay, great. So then the difference between eczema and psoriasis, can you talk a little bit about that? Did you catch that? Yes. You asked me the, yep. You asked me the difference between, I love how like today at this moment at the <laughs> topic of our podcast, it's like, oh, the internet's great today. No, I'm just kidding. Not going to be great today. Not going to be great today. All right. So I'm again, like psoriasis is not my jam. Eczema is more of my jam because it acts differently. So my, if I would, again, oversimplify, I would call psoriasis. Uh, I would lean more on an autoimmune manifestation and it responds massively to stress and anything that's autoimmune might respond more to diet than something else. So let me break that down a little bit more because I don't think that's going to make, like I talk about food all the time. So for me, I'm like, Oh, this makes sense in my brain. Let me talk about common food things with eczema. There are common food triggers with eczema, but I think you can overcome a lot of them because I think a lot of them break down to digestion issues 
And if you correct gut imbalances, you can correct a lot of diet and you support digestion processes. You can correct digestion. And here's the challenging part. You don't really realize that you don't digest very well. You might see undigested things in your stool, but unless you've got x-ray vision, it's not as clear as you'd like it to be sometimes. So there are some digestive or intestinal health markers like elastase, et cetera. And I still find those variable. I'm a huge bitters person. I will tell you, I've seen massive before and after changes in testing results from looking at bitters um, versus enzymes. But if you can digest well, you're going to help things kind of stay in um, shape, I guess, <laughs> I guess like in, stay in balance a little bit better. Okay. So if I'm talking about psoriasis, it's more of an autoimmune component in there. And I think both stress is affected by both. And it's actually stress is the last big component of like the last big bucket. If I oversimplify the eczema buckets, but more so with psoriasis, it seems that that really comes on, which is so consistent with autoimmune conditions. I feel like I don't know of an autoimmune condition that didn't have like the straw that broke its camel's back with stress, which no one really wants to hear that. Cause it's like kind of tricky. And of course, stress, we could talk about all the physiological changes that happen in the body from stress. That's like one of my favorite topics, but I would just say from a, what, what does psoriasis respond to stress stuff, autoimmune, like more, more dietary things because of the autoimmune thing. And here's the other thing I want you to know, if you do some diet changes and you do the, like the, the ones for autoimmune stuff, and you don't see a difference in like a month. And by the way, you shouldn't be over restricting. If you don't see a change in a month. You're probably not going to see that change. So I want to make sure I mention that since this is a public topic. And I want to make sure I don't ever send someone down a restriction rabbit hole. And I will also tell you, there's another pearl that works well for psoriasis. Cause I'm just a fan of telling you anything that will work for stuff. Um, there's a product called skin Nessa, not to give them, um, you know, special airtime, but they're a skin based probiotic and they have research based strains for skin conditions. And it just works a heck of a lot better for psoriasis than eczema. So this, um, so the research around it must really be driven for psoriasis above almost anything else. So like, those are some things that come to mind that have worked well for psoriasis versus eczema. Even if you, that's not what you wanted, this is like what I see from a clinical perspective of what works, which is more how my brain works. <laughs> it's like, what is the oversimplified version and how, um, how does it actually help someone change it? So I love simple I mean, because, because honestly, I don't know. When you go to the dermatologist, like it's actually a, a bit different. I did write some continuing ed for like, a, there's a big integrative dermatology, um, website. It's actually kind of, kind of great. Um, there's some good stuff there, but I, I love talking to dermatologists because they know so much that I don't know. And I think they're interested to, to sometimes know what, well, what are you doing that works? Because, you know, often we don't think of that. I mean, we just kind of do different things, right? We have different toolboxes, you might say. So, um, like there are some great topical staff things to address, right. That people can go to their dermatologist for. And some of them know about it. Like if someone has a severe, 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 severe eczema situation, and especially a teenager, um, I will usually like tell that mom, Hey, if this is like excessively red and severe, I'm going to, I would have you look at the Aaron regimen, which is very low dose. Um, it's very low dose steroid. I mean, even though our goal is not to be on steroids and a very low dose antibiotic, and it's got a, if you do it right, it's got a titration, titration schedule. You should get off of it because let's review. You should not be on steroids forever, but people are just put on steroids and left on steroids. And it can cause some ugly, it can cause some ugly problems and don't go be, don't be Googling topical steroid withdrawal unless you are like ready to see it because it is a real significant problem. I mean, you're supposed to be on steroids. What is it? Two or four weeks. I mean, you're the doctor here, right. isn't it four weeks or something? So it's really short term. Yeah. It's really short term. So when people are on it for years and they just keep, and they're just at, you know, just added, um, it seems to cause some very significant, serious, not cool issues. So I'm not sure how I got off on that one, but, um, but it's a, it's I hope a good it one to get off on. Yeah. That's good. important. And just to clarify, when you're talking about restriction, you're talking about food restriction, like a food elimination <laughs> diet, like decreasing the number of allergic, more allergic foods that you're consuming. Right. Um, yes. So there's a couple ways to go about that. And from an eczema perspective, cause remember eczema is part of the allergic or atopic March. And so that's kind of like slightly different than psoriasis, which is not exactly considered that to my knowledge, like it's not really in that grouping of things. So again, eczema is like, uh, and so I would say for the people who have bright red skin manifestations, 
you can see a bit of an improvement from watching those top eight allergens or doing like a two week thing where you're watching the top eight allergens. Um, dairy can be a big one because what happens if you want to know like what is actually happening for a lot of those small people Mm -hmm. is in the allergy, in the allergy situation, like what happens in the allergy process, your body should break down histamine, a natural neurotransmitter and chemical messenger that does is responsible for a lot of things. And our body is wicked smart. And so it should break things down and move them out when it has too much. And if it hasn't, um, kind of a bear, a wrench in its process, basically there is a genetic predisposition. So this helps corroborate what we were talking about before that. If you have a parent with allergies or eczema or asthma, you may not have a very speedy gene or genes, HNMT and DAO. You may not have speedy genes to break that down. Okay. So you're already like, I always call genetics, the cards that you're dealt. And then what's going on in your actual life is how you play the game. So cards you're dealt are not like, you know, a giving up point. That's just a, oh shoot. I am at a decreased advantage. For example, I am at a decreased advantage for liver um, genetics. Right. And once I can, uh, 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 I, I don't have to be like down on myself about that. I can just be empowered by it and say, oh, I have to give myself support every once in a while. Right. And I have to kind of pay attention to what's going on. I don't ever know if I, if I finish the thought with, if I drink crappy coffee, I'll get like an um, uh, like a, I don't know what the word is. It doesn't, it's like a tingle. It's not, it's like a feeling around my eye. It's like a, if I drink this crappy guy and I'm like, Oh, you know what? I think I better back off. <laughs> I think that was too, I think that was too much. Um, it's a very, un, it's a very unusual feeling. It doesn't actually break out as anything, but it's like, eh, it's a, it's a sensation is the right word that I was mm-hmm. looking for. Um, so sensation, where was I going with all of this? Got distracted on the sensation around the eye. You did too. You got lost as well. Thanks. It wasn't just me. I appreciate that. <laughs> I thought it was just going to be me. This is what happens when I don't have like stuff in front of me and Chris is just rambling about stuff that I hope is useful. We were talking about allergies is what we were talking about, the histamine. So right. your body's supposed to break down DAO and HNMT. If you have imbalances and a sluggish liver, it's not going to break that down. It's not going to move it on out. Same thing, by the way, if you have if you have allergies or skin stuff and it gets worse, you know, it's a very popular topic, but thank you for social media for telling me this skin flares and hormone times of the month. So like, it's very common for Mm. women to have skin flares around their, their cycle starting. And so there's an upswing in estrogen. And so it's very similar mechanism. If I, again, oversimplify your body should break down excess estrogen and move it on out. And so if it doesn't have the capability to do that, because there's a big old mess in where those enzymatic reactions happen in the gut and the liver is a little sluggish, it's not going to move out either one of those things. So you'll see an increase in estrogen excess symptoms like breakouts around right before your cycle and possibly mid month, there's two spikes of estrogen. Uh, you'll see the skin breakouts, you'll see moodiness, you'll see breast tenderness, you'll see, maybe you'll have a heavy flow because estrogen is a growth hormone. So sometimes we want to, anytime we hear about these things, we're like, Oh, too much estrogen. I don't want, like you want a balance, my friend, because too little equals, you know, hot flashes and poor bone health, but so it's a growth, it's a growth hormone. And so it, it predicts how thick your uterine lining is. So I was like to, I just love to tell you the how things work. And so if you have a lot of estrogen, you're going to have that heavy cycle. So if you have, it's very common. If I see someone with that, like gut mediated style eczema, or they have allergies, I will just check in with how their cycle symptoms are, because that's going to be, those are going to kind of go together. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. so it's fun because then if you correct one thing, you now improved several things, right? I know that's one of your favorite topics as well. So the allergic um, process, right? So if you help break down histamine better and clear it out. That's useful. So I guess I get like very concerned that people are going to go Google stuff about histamine and then they're going to eliminate stuff. And I just, I'm like standing here on a hilltop saying, please process it, <laughs> please process it better. Don't go and hide from it. Right. Don't go and hide. Please process things better. And you, we could say that about a lot of food things that people food relationship things that people get into. Don't go hide from something that's giving you trouble. Let's try to, uh, let's try to metabolize. Let's try to break it down and use it better. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that that's really interesting because, you know, the food elimination diet has been used by functional medicine practitioners or is used a lot. And it's because it provides a lot of really good success. But can you tell us a little bit about some of your concerns about that restriction? Like what ends up happening that's bad when it comes to doing that restriction? Oh, what ends up happening that's bad? That's a great question. So what happens is if you restrict over restrict, you are probably over restricting carbohydrates. And what your gut is supposed to do is metabolize, break down and use carbohydrates for not only energy, which seems really important for this conversation. So like some dead ringers here is when people eat carbs, their skin gets worse or they get more tired, right? Just totally a gut thing. Like those, those gut bugs are using it up and stealing right. your nutrients for sure. But if you don't break that stuff down, um, your body can't make short chain fatty acids, which are your guts superheroes to heal itself. That's like our body already had built-in backup plans to like work on healing itself. And with these imbalances, it, we cannot metabolize and make short chain fatty acids. So this is a great topic because, uh, with long-term ketogenic diets and now the hot topic is, which I don't see a ton, but I almost got into kind of an argument with someone on Instagram the other day and I just decided it was not worth any level of any part of my brain but carnivore stuff. Are you familiar with the carnivore situation going on right now? Yeah. So people will be really happy about how they feel on a carnivore diet. Well, you just removed all the carbs. So this is equivalent to like when you remove all the FODMAPs, when you have IBS or like, Oh, I just feel good off carbs. Like you might feel good off carbs and that's totally fine to experiment with and see what makes you feel good. But what will happen over time is like our body does use carbohydrates depending on what kind of activities and energy and what we need to do. So you mm -hmm. need to be able to be compatible with them. You need to be able to use those. So the short answer was if you decrease a lot of foods, your, like your gut starts to look emaciated and then it's actually harder to bounce back. I have a great analogy for this. It's like trying to make a community garden out of an abandoned parking lot. Like when things are emaciated. And so, and that's exactly what it looks like on those, on those gut tests, et cetera. Like everything is really low and kind of pathetic. And I've just clinically, it takes longer for people to bounce back from that. It's very difficult for people to bounce back. So interesting because it's more stressful on the body. Um, because you, if you don't have, if you're not taking in a lot of nutrients and you aren't really correcting the root cause as you would appreciate, if you're just eliminating, you are one robbing yourself of nutrients, even worse than you were before, right? If you were, couldn't digest them, you weren't going to get the nutrients either, but you're robbing yourself of nutrients and diversity because people like eat the same few foods over and over. So real lack of diversity, which is a huge microbiome problem. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, you can't make the things, the, sh the fatty acid, like the short chain fatty acids that your gut needs to heal itself. Um, does that make, does that make sense? I hope. Yeah. So then, so then what's the role of gluten and dairy? Do you remove those? Are they okay? Do you think they're okay for people to continue to consume? They're probably some of the top ones to try. And I think, and my approach is I'm like an all in, like, I'm like a, it kind of depends on where you are and your overwhelm in your life. If someone is very overwhelmed by something, they might just try one thing because if they aren't familiar with something, it's going to feel difficult. The first time you try to do something, it's difficult. I don't care what it is. You ride a bike, you go skiing, you go unicycle difficult. Right. right. Um, but after you've done something more than once, it becomes easy. Right. So I would love people with food issues or sensitivities or allergies to come over to my house because I know exactly what to do for them. <laughs> and I've got all the things I can do to help support, like to, to feed them delicious stuff with, with substitutions. Not everyone can do that because they've just started. So if they're overwhelmed, they should start with one thing. I prefer to like do everything at once. It's a lot shorter. Otherwise it turns into this long thing forever and ever. So I like, I actually, I never want to be someone's first food experiment. And I'm like, go try something on your own, please. <laughs> um, and then come back and I'll like walk you through it. Cause otherwise you can't appreciate how much fast or it could be sometimes too, or you're just not prepared. Like you, you've literally never done it before. And so then it becomes an, a more of an emotional thing <laughs> than anything, right? This is where it's like, I want to be emotionally supportive and also let's separate what our body needs right now to what's emotionally. So I have to address that because emotions around food are very real. <laughs> so I would say, um, 
not for everyone, but for gluten, gluten and dairy are the, the most common ones to take out right away. There's a few others. Actually, eggs are kind of a hard to digest protein. Eggs are incredibly nutritious. All of these foods are actually incredibly nutritious. Technically, technically. Um, I mean, I have feelings about wheat and why we struggle with wheat living in a wheat field. I think it's so fascinating. And I'm just like really curious about it. Like why, because you know, the, uh, hypothesis that we spray wheat with glyphosate is the reason people struggle with it. That's not true. They rarely spray wheat with glyphosate actually. So I'm like, well, what else is going wrong? I don't know if you cared, uh, but yeah, removing wheat and gluten. There's many, there's many ways people can be sensitive to wheat and dairy is a high histamine thing. So you'll often see, you actually tend to see a pretty significant change when you change dairy. And then I would say, Hey, can you help them? Like most people would like to eat cheese again. Like you might feel okay with this for a while, but most of us like cheese. And so it's nice if you can tolerate it. Now, again, if you've got a whole other autoimmune manifestation situation going on, um, those people respond really beautifully to very specific food changes, I would say long-term. But if you've got some eczema that is treatable and you'd like to be able to consume those foods in some capacity, then our goal is to try to do that. But it I would say like, those are the most common ones to pull. And I tend to like to pull those right away. And I like to see an improvement because when you're not itching and you can sleep well, your life now changes. And by the way, there is an increase in inflammatory cytokines from the environment and from food and whatnot. Sometimes I can change people's diets. You know, when you see, you get a little like PTSD when you see people restrict, right? And so I just wanted to acknowledge all of those things. Thank you. So- So then what's the first thing that you, or what's the thing that you have found to be absolutely the most helpful thing to help people with eczema? Mm, That's a great question. So first I like to decide what is their biggest stressor? Is it a gut? And I think that's really like you pick the first starting place and then, you know, because guess what, if your primary stressor is liver, you may not see dramatic changes from changing your diet in the same way that the gut person should change their diet. So like you might just need to clean up your diet from toxins and like stuff if liver is your primary thing. So we talked about what that looks like for liver stuff. We talked about what it looks like for gut stuff. So depending on where your starting place is, if if gut is your starting place, you can actually make some diet changes and probably see a big difference. You also want to calm that skin down on the outside. So you can like, you want to do whatever you can to sleep well. I would say like, you might want to make like, that might be the time where you use steroids for a while so you can sleep, right? Because if you can't sleep, you also can't heal. Right. That might be the end of that, that statement, but it would depend on, is it, um, is the priority liver is the priority gut or is the priority? This is the most recent one stress. And this is actually super timely. We're having an outbreak of hand eczema because we use a ton of, well, we were this last year, we're using a ton of, uh, antiseptics. Yeah. Uh, alcohol stuff. And our, our skin has a little fatty acid layer has like, you know, it has a little fatty acid layer and it's meant to be antimicrobial. And so when we strip that away with alcohol, we're now allowing microbes to set up shop on the skin, which is a topical stressor by the way. But another clinical pearl is that I've never seen aside from like disrupting the topical microbiome of the hands usually, and you can very easily trace this in people's history. If you, if you had eczema as a little kid, and then it presents kind of a little bit as an adult and it starts to present on their hands for the first time as an adult, that is stress because Mm. where it shows up on the body can somewhat tell you a little bit about the skin. So this was a pearl, I kind of learned from a genius micronutrient mentor I had, and he would um, tell me about when cortisol and stress is up, it dumps B5 or pantothenic acid. And so, and that deficiency can be related to this hand eczema. And I would just say every single hand eczema case I see gets exacerbated via stress and by stress and certainly topical stress, but also, but I will see that same pattern. Like I had as a kid disappeared. And when it came back as an adult, if the last thing I got was hand eczema was so like when stress becomes the icing on the cake. And that, then that's then the priority, right? So it's, is the gut, the priority, which you'll, you'll see some difference from food. If guts, the priority is liver, the priority, which you can see some difference from, from foods. I want to just support the liver in whatever capacity. Like I want to make sure I have good bowel movements and I'm drinking enough. I mean, you could, that's a whole tangent. Um, and if it's stress, I want to support stress. So the, the shortest answer is I want you to sleep, right? We don't sleep one third of our day on accident. 
So we got to do whatever we can <laughs> to sleep because a lot of times the itching will keep you up at night. Nice. So, it, you know, so much of this is really talking about immune system modification or modulation, right? You sleep and the immune system repairs itself. When you have stress, the immune system gets dysfunctional. All these things we're talking about, heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, allergies, all that sort of stuff ends up modifying the immune system. So it makes sense that that would end up affecting an autoimmune skin issue like eczema. True. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. That's one way to say it. It's a very eloquent way to say it. Oh, well, thank you. So <laughs> a couple last questions here. So I'm doing an event right now on fatigue and autoimmunity, given that the causes of autoimmunity are also very similar to the causes of fatigue. How many people or what percent or just a, a rough estimate of how many people do you see who have eczema that also have fatigue? Oh gosh. I always think fatigue is a cofactor for everyone in, in my, co and it's just a matter of, do you resonate? I think fatigue is one of those like gray areas on what level do you have fatigue, right? Mm. Do you, can you pop out of bed in the, uh, out of bed in the morning energized? Do you need coffee at two o'clock in the afternoon? Cause you hit a wall. Are you wired and tired before bed, but then you can't fall asleep. I mean, like what level of fatigue are we talking? Because I think everyone can improve, you know, I used to get back to the coffee. I used to, if I would get a coffee and it had regular milk in it, when I was still struggling to like work through that, I, it would like make me want to go to sleep, which is the opposite effect of coffee, mm. right? Coffee should make you want to be awake. And so my point is, um, the, it was the, it was the regular, like, that's how sensitive my liver was. It would like mm. make me tired to clear out that like regular milk. Like it, that was like so pathetic. It can be so subtle. Like the average person may not notice that, but it was so much more marked because coffee's supposed to do the opposite. And so if I want to take a nap, like uh, automatically after this, this coffee with milk, it's like, what is wrong with this? It's not getting, you know, processed properly. So I guess I feel like it's everybody, but you know, it's a little different when it's a kid and they have tons of energy. It's like, well, if you have a sleep issue or a sleep dysfunction, you're more tired. I mean, I have a lot of feelings about tired and like sleep. I feel like six and seven hours of sleep is not technically enough for anyone. If you cared, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it is, did you know that there's a study it's, I think it's only 25 or 50 people, but they looked at people who slept seven hours and they looked at people who slept eight hours and the people that slept seven hours, they put common cold virus in each of their noses. And so the people that slept seven hours had a 300%, 294% increase in the cold as the people who slept eight hours. I think that's freaking amazing. It's insane. Yeah. I love telling that. I love giving that example because it's very dramatic. <laughs> Eight hours and for everybody. And sometimes we need dramatic, right? Like so I'm just mentioning, I'm just, I'm just restating what they found. That's all I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. so I guess I feel like there is a lot of, I feel like fatigue is uh widespread. It's just a matter of does a person think they have a problem or not? We could we could all want to be more energized and awake. Right. I think that's a wonderful thing, right? Agreed. So Krista, where can people learn more about you? My favorite place, if you weren't too annoyed by this conversation and how fast I talk, my favorite place to connect with people is on my own podcast, which is The Less Stress Life. And like I said, Dr. Hirsch has a couple episodes over there because that is my favorite. This is my favorite way to talk to people. You cannot wrap this much stuff in a newsletter or an Instagram post, right? right. So, and you can't do it and you can't read them while you're washing dishes. So I just love the podcast. Otherwise you can find me living over at kristabigler.com slash links. And we'll drop those links below. Krista, thanks so much for joining me today. You bet. I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter where I share all important facts and information about fatigue, from the foods and supplements 
to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, it's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening and have an amazing day.